This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Everyone is exposed everywhere, every time, to toxic chemicals. The big challenge is to try to minimize these exposures. It is in the food, the water, the environment, domestic pollution, industrial pollution. There's been an over 15-fold increase in uh, chemicals that are manufactured or imported into the United States since the 1950s. And that rise coincides with the rise that we're seeing in a number of different uh, chronic conditions. And doctors as well as the public, they are totally unaware of the influence of environmental toxin on an individual. For example, there are a number of people dying of renal disease prematurely at the age of 30, 35, 40, because 20 years ago they were pumping agrochemicals and pesticides and it just went into the ground and spoiled the water supply. They didn't know what they were drinking and now they are suffering from renal disease. This opinion by FIGO is based on scientific evidence and it's really important that obstetricians and gynecologists who are the main physicians for women and women's health are informed about the facts. We have seen changes in cancer rates, thyroid disorders, miscarriages, large increases in ADHD, autism rates, deformities of the, the penis, such as hypospadias, decrease in sperm counts. At the 21st FIGO World Congress in Vancouver, 7,000 physicians, midwives, and healthcare professionals gathered to explore global trends in maternal and child health. A top item of discussion, how to reduce exposure to toxic chemicals worldwide. Testicular uh, cancer was going through the roof yeah. across Europe. Right. You know, and the hard evidence like that is, you know, well, wow, this is serious. We can't expect cures. We need to be much more thoughtful about prevention. Many people just assume that chemicals must have been tested before they were released into the environment, and therefore they must be safe. And that really isn't the case. There are different times during development and also as a child, adolescent, and as an adult that individuals can be exposed to toxic chemicals that can change the course of development or the ability to reproduce or the course of a pregnancy and also can change human health, not only for the generation that is affected, but also for subsequent generations. The science, physicians around the world say, can no longer be ignored. There's been an explosion in our technological ability to measure industrial chemicals in people. And what they found was not just one, two, three, four, but dozens of industrial chemicals measured inside of people, in children, and in pregnant women, so that babies are now being born pre-polluted with a number of different industrial chemicals that have been measured in cord blood. We've got to shift the burden of proof from the lay public, the scientists, the physicians like me, back to the chemical industry. The reality is there is no law in the United States right now that requires that chemicals be fully tested before they're used in products that come into our home, and so we're inadvertently exposing our children to a lot of these different types of industrial chemicals, and we're paying the price in terms of our health. In Scotland, following the ban on smoking in public places, there was a 15% reduction in preterm birth. For very preterm children, it declined by 25%. This was much greater than any of us expected. And what it shows is that even very low level exposure to toxins can have a big impact on preterm birth. When lead in the United States was banned from gasoline, the lead levels in gasoline went down at the same time that the lead levels in children went down together. So what can you do? There are real things we can do to reduce exposures, but we have to engage and we have to do research and we have to have patients and doctors having this kind of counseling happen. The same way we counsel about birth control pills and, uh, you know, healthy diet and healthy lifestyles. There are some things that the patient can't control. A good example is air pollution. We know air pollution is linked to adverse health effects all across the lifespan, starting with reproduction and development. But one person cannot stop air pollution themselves. Pesticides in various uh, foods as well as uh, 
the injection of hormones in uh, the animals. Ultimately, anything which is chemical is going to affect the health uh, of uh, women and children. Giving a voice to the people who are who are kind of in the in the trenches. So the the workers who are working with pesticides and have no masks, they can be given a stronger voice. Physicians and other healthcare professionals are needed on the front lines of this effort. This is, as I said, a very big task in teaching to our future obstetrician gynecologists. If they know this in the school, in the resident school, in the school of medicine, I think that this will change the impact of the environment toward ourselves and ourselves toward the environment. And we'll be more respectful at the end. This is a global problem that needs a global solution, so it's time to act on a uh, global scale. I'm really hoping that our generation of doctors will take on the issue of environmental health so that we can see healthy babies and healthy moms for generations to come. I'm delighted to have you here for our Reproductive Health in the Environment session. This is really the third in a series of meetings at this conference where we're discussing the important aspects of the environment and its impact on our health. On Sunday, we had a pre-Congress symposium where 22 members from 22 nations and territories addressed reproductive health in the environment. I'm Jean Connery. I'm past President of the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and I'm going to have an opportunity to introduce this program this morning. I want to thank all of you for being here. It really is an exciting time. We had Dr. Linda Judice yesterday address this for the entire scientific program. Last week, FIGO introduced our, the opinion that all of us as OBGYNs, as the ones who are so passionate about women's health, have an obligation to both understand the research to be able to advocate and to discuss the important aspects of health when it comes to the environment. This is a follow-up to that because we believe in it, painting a very um, clear picture, each one of you will have an understanding that's very important here. Um, we've put together a, a whole um, amount of information called Recommendations for Preventing Exposures to Toxic Chemicals, where we really are asking for advocacy to awareness on environmental justice, to making sure that our um, food systems are healthy and that we can make recommendations for family members um, and our own OBGYN and medical community on how to take care of the health aspects of reproductive health of, of the environment. This is an example of the opinion that came out last week, the International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics opinion on reproductive health impacts of exposure to toxic environmental chemicals. So we're very delighted to see this and the fact that our um, current president of FIGO and our incoming president of FIGO have both said that we need to put together a task force, a working group in this area. We have the support of a number of medical organizations around the world to address this topic. And this morning I have the pleasure of bringing experts here to really grab your attention, to tell you about some of the areas of most interest, to describe some of the research, and then to paint a picture. What I'd like to do is introduce the panel now, and then the panel members will come up here for their talk, um, and then we'll hold all the questions till the very end. Let me, um, in the order of presenters, um, 
present who's going to be here, who's presenting their talks. Dr. Tyrone Hayes is a professor in the Laboratory for Integrative Studies in Amphibian Biology, the Department of Integrative Biology, the University of California, Berkeley. Might I point out he's a PhD on a, a stand with a, a number of um, MDs. At UC Berkeley and in ponds around the world, Professor Hayes studies frogs and other amphibians. <laughs> He is the subject of the children's book, The Frog Scientist, and his work was recently covered in Mother Jones and The New Yorker. And I have to say that he was part of my presidential program, and I was so excited to hear how he's able to bring this to women's health, and he received a standing ovation at our ACOG meeting. Gaji Cook is an elder Mohawk midwife. She is co-founder of the National Aboriginal Council of Midwives of Canada and founding Aboriginal midwife of the Six Nations Birthing Center in Oswegan, Ontario. She is a member of the Mohawk community of Akwesasne, um, located in northern New York State, southwestern Quebec, and southeastern Ontario. She is an internationally recognized activist in the field of environmental health and reproductive health, and is currently the program director for indigenous community initiatives at Novo Foundation, where she is designing new work on the leadership of indigenous girls and women. Dr. Tracy Woodruff is professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Reproductive Sciences at the University of California, San Francisco. And Tracy is the director of the UC San Francisco program on reproductive health and the environment. And Tracy has done everything. She, Tracy was a scientist with the EPA and has done an incredible amount of work. I, it, Tracy and um, her colleagues at UC San Francisco really are the, the glue that's put all of this together. Her scientific background with the EPA and what she brings to this really provides the credibility and the information for all of us. So it's really been exciting to have her be a part of this. Um, she really is an expert on early life development and how chemicals and environmental toxicants impact our health. And then I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Jennifer Blake. Um, Jennifer is the CEO of the Society for Obstetricians and Gynecologists in Canada. And she has been a collaborator, a colleague, a voice for all of the work that we've done here. Um, really an important part of this. Had the wonderful opportunity to introduce everybody to this um, in our, our programs. And really has been a wonderful person to work with. Um, she is a leader in academics, in clinical and regulatory perspectives. And in 2011, um, Dr. Blake was identified as one of the top 25 women of influence in Canada. So please join me in welcoming this illustrious group of speakers. From Silent Spring to Silent Night, a tale of toads and men. Before I start, I, as always, I'd like to acknowledge the people who um, have given me support. One is my family. I want to acknowledge them for their love and support. I want to acknowledge my funding sources uh, over the last 20 years. And I also want to, as a matter of disclosure, point out that I have been funded by the uh, chemical industry, by Novartis and Syngenta. And finally, I want to thank all of the students that have been involved in the work. But of course, they're the ones who do the work while I go around and simply talk about it. So about 20 years ago, I started working on a chemical atrazine. As an amphibian endocrinologist, I was asked to identify whether or not atrazine was an endocrine disruptor in amphibians. And for those of you not in the know, atrazine is a so-called S-chlorotriazine. It's an herbicide or weed killer, mostly used on corn in the US, and it's been used since 1958. We use 80 million pounds annually in the US now. It's a second now only to glyphosate or Roundup. It's used in more than 80 countries, but is now outlawed in all of Europe, or as the lawyers like to say, it has been denied regulatory approval in the European Union. The significance being, of course, that Novartis and Syngenta is based in Switzerland, and, and in fact, the chemical is not allowed in the home country. So I started doing the work on African clawed frogs, this guy here, and, and it, with exposure to atrazine at ecologically relevant doses, we showed that it inhibited growth of the voice box or the larynx in frogs, which was an indication that the animals weren't producing testosterone properly. We then explored the effects on the gonads, because testosterone comes from the gonads, of course, and we discovered that a percentage of the animals exposed to atrazine at doses as low as 0.1 parts per billion had multiple testes in ovaries or were hermaphrodites. And, and those of you may not know, but amphibians are not naturally hermaphroditic, despite what you may have read or seen in Jurassic Park. Um, we hypothesized that the following was happening. Normally, the testis should produce testosterone, and the atrazine we propose in, 
produce the enzyme aromatase, which converts testosterone into estrogen. And there was already evidence in alligators and later in human cells that atrazine did just that. Uh, the idea is that you would be depleted of your testosterone and thus demasculinize and subsequently feminize if exposed during development. We went on to show that, in fact, if you expose adult frogs to atrazine, there is a significant reduction in male testosterone levels such that they are not different from females. We later went on to show in another paper that was also published in Proceedings to the National Academy of Sciences that when these animals became adults, a proportion of them actually completely, even though they were genetic males, developed and functioned as females. So for example, there is a gene uh, called DMW that's present only in females. And we could show, for example, that this couple is in fact two genetic males and that the one on the bottom, even though it's a genetic male, completely functioned as a, as a female and laid egg, viable eggs and, and all that. Um, we went on to show that the males that were exposed that didn't turn into females actually suffer a, a big drop in fertility. So fertility drops from 85% to about 15%. And part of that is because they don't show the behaviors, but it's also because if you look at the testis under the microscope, and here's a control, and as you can see, full of sperm, the atrazine exposed animals lack sperm and have at most cellular debris in their testicular tubules. Very clear differences. We also showed that animals in another species are leopard frogs, that males develop eggs in the testis. So you can see here eggs mm -hmm. bursting through the surface of, of this male's testis. And we also showed that effects occur in the wild. To give you an idea of how much atrazine is, is actually out there, uh, the package re recommends 2.9 to 29 million parts per billion. That's 290 million times what we used in the laboratory. What I'm showing you now are minimum and maximum levels in agricultural runoff, temporary pools, permanent water and precipitation. Here are the levels, and this is a log scale, here are the levels that we use in the, in the laboratory. So in fact, even rainwater can carry enough atrazine to produce the kinds of effects that I've shown you. As much as a half million pounds of atrazine come down in rainwater every year, and it can travel over 1,000 miles. What's more is the EPA drinking standard for atrazine is three parts per billion, which is 30 times higher than we're using in the laboratory. In the field, in the wild, so those were our laboratory studies, we also showed that animals are affected. So when you collect, collect animals from areas that are impacted with atrazine, I'm going to show you a cross-section of this testis, and I'll blow this up, and I'll blow this up. These are what we've termed testicular oocytes. So instead of sperm in the testis, they have oocytes developing in the testis, even though they're genetically male and actually have testis. So I show this slide, this is a slide from Uganda, a place called Lake Nabugabu, and I show it because I think it clearly illustrates the connections between public health and environmental health. The water that you see here in the pond, which is running off of this crop, is the sole source of drinking and cooking water for this nearby village. Whereas I think we're a little disconnected, here's my village, we're a little disconnected in the way that we live in that we assume that the water that comes out of our faucet is safe because there's no E. coli, et cetera, in it. And the, safe to drink. So I call this from Silent Spring to Silent Night because I believe in much the same way that Rachel Carson taught that the Silent Spring and the death of birds due to pesticides were warning to us about our own health. I think in much the same way the decline in amphibians, up to 80% of all amphibian species worldwide are in decline, and our pending Silent Night is also a warning to us. Um, I've gathered data now from 22 countries from labs around the world to show that not only do these effects occur in amphibians, but others have shown similar effects in fish, birds, reptiles, and mammals, including epidemiological studies in humans. So the frogs are telling us something. We published a paper, again, 22 of us from, from sorry, 13 different countries. And in that we showed, for example, here are my frog testes that I showed you before, sperm in the testes, give them atrazine, no sperm. This is work that was done in Belgium independently in fish. This is work that was done in Argentina in a reptile, like a big alligator. Again, give them atrazine, no sperm in the testis. This is work that was done both in Nigeria and in Croatia in a rat. So sperm in the testicular tubule, rats exposed to atrazine, no sperm. And this is work that was done in Pakistan in quail, in birds. So this effect has been shown in every vertebrate class that's been examined. So is the decline in sperm due to a decline in testosterone as I suggested in amphibians. Well, not only my work, there's work in fish, this work was done in, in England, there's work, my work in frogs, and there's work in rats showing that atrazine exposure causes a decline in testosterone across vertebrate classes. 
My colleague Shauna Swan showed the following. She looked at men in Columbia, Missouri and showed that there is a significant correlation between low sperm count, poor semen quality, inability to get your wife pregnant, and atrazine levels in the urine. And again, I, you know, we're extrapolating a bit because it's only correlation, very strong correlation, but these men have as much atrazine in their urine as we use to chemically castrate frogs, and by coincidence, they have low sperm count. What's more is, I've dropped the data down now, if I show you levels of atrazine in field workers in California, and then if I drop that down and show you levels of atrazine in men who apply atrazine in California, men who apply atrazine have up to 24,000 times the atrazine in their urine than we know is associated with poor semen quality and low sperm count. In other words, as I tell my lay audiences, these guys have enough atrazine in their urine that I could have them pee in a bucket and I could dilute it 24,000 times and use the atrazine in their urine to chemically castrate and feminize 24,000 buckets of 30 tadpoles each. Of course, most of these men are uh, Mexican-American. We have no idea of the health consequences of their exposure. But we do know that this is an environmental justice issue. California, as you may know, is the fifth largest economy in the world because of agriculture. One in 10 jobs are in ag, 30% of the land is in ag, 350 agricultural products come out of California. And I didn't notice until I started studying this issue, but 50% of the U.S.'s food, half of the U.S.'s food comes out of California. We use more pesticides than any other state, and 90% of the workers are Hispanic. And now if I put in red here the top 10 counties for agriculture, these are technically the top 10 counties, the counties that make California the fifth largest economy in the world. If I map onto that the 30 poorest towns in California, there's a clear correlation between the people who make us the fifth largest economy in the world and the people who are exposed to chemicals that we know are associated with adverse health outcomes. On the other half of the equation, does atrazine induce aromatase and produce estrogen? I talked about vitiligenesis and oogenesis, sort of production of eggs, which we don't have to worry about in humans. We sort of have genetic protection from that. But aromatase and estrogen are important in both mammary cancer and prostate cancer. With regards to prostate cancer, there's a study out of their own factory in San Gabriel, Louisiana, that shows that there's an 8.4-fold increase in the incidence of prostate cancer in men who work in their factory compared to men who work in the factory but don't bag the atrazine. And it's a community that's 80% African-American. There's at least one study in Kentucky that showed with a p-value less than 0.0001 that women whose well water is contaminated with atrazine are more likely to develop breast cancer compared to women who live in the same community but don't use their well water for drinking. Again, it's just correlation, but if you look at studies from their own company, they show that rats suffer a decrease in testosterone when exposed to atrazine and a concomitant increase in estrogen, just like we've shown in frogs and fish and other animals. They've also shown that if you give rats atrazine, there's a significant increase in the incidence of mammary tumors. So again, the human data are just correlation, but it's supported by laboratory data from rodents. And these are rats. In humans, we've shown, and, and as well as their scientists have shown, that if you give a human cancer cell atrazine, it'll start producing aromatase. Just like we've shown in fish, just like we've shown in frogs, just like they've shown in reptiles, just like we've shown in rats. Now these are human cell lines. I went to visit them. I still think their name should be spelled with an I instead of a Y, but <laughs> nobody listens to me. Uh, what's significant is they have a pipe that runs right into the Mississippi River. 1.2 million pounds of atrazine flow into the Gulf of Mexico every year. 1.2 million pounds. In a community where much of it looks like this. These are the top 13 cancers that you're going to get in the U.S. And in red now, 11 of the 13 are the ones that you're more likely to get if you're African American. And I can show similar data for Hispanic Americans. Mortality relative to whites shows that 13 out of 13 cancers, you're more likely to die if you're African American. And while I'm all for Coleman for the cure, I think we need to have a Coleman for finding the cause. Is this a biological mm -hmm. difference or is it that if you're a minority, you're more likely to live in and more likely to work in areas where you're exposed to chemicals that we know are associated with adverse health outcomes. And now with what we know about epigenetics and the ability to carry these pesticides outside of our communities, even if you move away, you're probably still at higher risk. A student of mine showed that if you take a breast cancer cell and expose it to atrazine, it upregulates the enzyme aromatase, the gene for aromatase. Again, just like we've shown in fish, just like we've shown in birds, just like we've shown in frogs, just like we've shown in rats. And the significance of that is the following. Of course, up to 90% of breast cancers dependent on estrogen. 
And we now know that much of that estrogen that drives the breast cancer is produced locally in fibroblasts around the breast cancer cells. So they have their own mechanism for producing estrogen. The irony is the number one treatment for breast cancer right now is a chemical called letrozole, which decreases aromatase and decreases estrogen and stops your damaged cells from growing and spreading. It's quite ironic that the number one contaminant of drinking water in the US does exactly the opposite, turns on aromatase, increases estrogen, promotes breast cancer in rats, and is associated with breast cancer in humans. I got in big trouble with the lawyers when I pointed out that, in fact, Novartis, up until the year 2000, made both chemicals. So Novartis made both the atrazine, the number one contaminant of drinking water, and the letrozole that was being used to treat breast cancer. So that if you were taking letrozole in the Midwest, where atrazine is used, how is that impacted by the atrazine that's contaminated, contaminating your drinking water? So I think that my interest in this aquatic organism has taught me quite a bit about this aquatic organism. Because the same hormones that are important in early amphibian development, the thyroid hormone, the estrogen, testosterone, those exact thyroid hormones, those same hormones, identical hormones, are important in early human development. And I would argue that one of my tadpoles trapped in a contaminated pond or contaminated aquaria is no different than a human fetus trapped in a contaminated amniotic fluid. Studies now show that we are exposed to over 300 synthetic chemicals before we leave the womb. Most of them, we have no idea what they do. We do know from rodent studies that atrazine induces prostate and mammary cancer, peer-reviewed and published. We do know that atrazine causes immune failure, which we've also shown in frogs. We do know that atrazine causes neural damage when you're exposed in utero. It's peer-reviewed and published. And EPA laboratories showed that if you give pregnant rats atrazine, they're more likely to have an abortion. If those rats don't abort, another EPA laboratory showed that the sons, the male pups, are born with prostate disease. They're born with the prostate of an old man. A third EPA laboratory published several papers showing that if those rats that don't abort, the female pups are born with impaired mammary development, such that when those pups grow up, they showed in another publication, that their offspring have experienced retarded growth and development. And this moved me more than my work. Because see, the rat on the bottom, the rat on the bottom never saw atrazine. The rat on the bottom was affected by atrazine that its grandmother was exposed to. The rat on the bottom never saw atrazine. The rat on the bottom was affected by atrazine that its grandmother was exposed to. So when I think about my little girl, she's about to turn 20 now, and the fact that my grandchildren could be affected by chemicals that we're using today moves me in a very, very different way. A colleague of mine independently showed that if you look at birth defects, you're more likely to have a child with birth defects if you're pregnant doing peak atrazine contamination when it's being applied and running off the fields. Another study showed, and this is agriculture-related chemical exposure, season of concept and risk of gastrothesis in Washington state. They concluded that maternal exposure to surface water atrazine is associated with fetal gastrocesis, particularly in spring conceptions. And normally I'm not talking to a medically oriented audience, so I like to show people just exactly what gastrocesis is. Um, there's some communities where this rare condition shows up in seven houses in those communities where it's known that atrazine contamination is present. This is another study showing that maternal residential atrazine exposure is linked to the risk of coenal atresia. This is where the nasal cavity and the oral cavity don't close up. And one that's more interesting to me is a case control study of maternal residential atrazine exposure in male genital malformations. This study, I, I won't read this all to you, but this study showed that atrazine was associated with hypospadias. That's where the urethra doesn't end all the way through the penis. This study showed that atrazine is associated with cryptorchidism, where the testicles don't descend into the scrotum, and it's associated with micropenis, where the penis doesn't grow. And I say that this one's more interesting to me because these are all effects. Male genital development depends on testosterone, as you all know. And if you give a fetus, if you expose a fetus to atrazine, which decreases testosterone in fish, in birds, in reptiles, in rats, if you expose a male fetus to a chemical that induces estrogen, it produces these effects, which are known to be caused by estrogen exposure. So it's not just frogs. I think. I probably don't have to tell this group, but we need to, this guy doesn't like me. That's why he's him in the picture. He's one of the guys who lobbies for Syngenta. But I think I probably don't have to tell this group that we need to evaluate chemicals not based on the health consequences to an adult white male, 
that exposure to the fetus at much lower levels can have a much bigger and more permanent impact. Exposure through milk even after the baby's born and just exposure to a young person, a little bit of poison is a lot of poison. And again, I don't think I have to stress that to this group. I want to conclude with the EPA. There was an article in New Yorker magazine, and the article focused on how Syngenta, or what word can I use, terrorized me and, and tried to discredit me. And, and there was a quote from the New, York, in New Yorker magazine from an EPA spokesperson that I found very interesting. They acknowledge that atrazine does the things that, I, that we've shown. And their comment to, news, to the New Yorker was, a monetary value is assigned to disease impairments and shortened lives and weighed against the benefits of keeping a chemical in use. In the case of atrazine, it only increases corn yield by 1.2%, a crop that we eat less than 2% of. Most of the corn now, the majority of corn is used to produce ethanol. We eat less than 2% when 20% of the world dies because they don't have access to staples. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for your time and your presence. Um, Novo Foundation uh, works on transformation from a world of domination and exploitation to one of collaboration and partnership, such as we have represented here at this panel. Uh, empowering girls and women is the primary agents of change. So one Mohawk word for midwife is yewelogwas. And it means she's pulling the baby out of the water, out of the earth, or a dark, wet place. This idea positions the body in a unity of knowledge such that, such that cosmology, ecology, and reproductive health are interconnected. And so woman is, in my uh, traditional thinking, the first environment, an episteme of our Six Nations Iroquois na narrative of creation represented by this painting by one of our Medicine Society leaders, John Suwatize Thomas. This primordial image of the pregnant sky woman, the feminine being, is the first mother of our Iroquois creation story. And it reminds us that the pregnant woman's body, not just the womb, is the fetus's first environment, first medicine, first relationship, and first experience. As a narrative of creation, indigenous to the Great Lakes Basin ecosystem where the Mohawk people reside, Turtle's Back represents the Canadian shield, the continental core of North America, and it's why we refer to the North American continent as Turtle Island. The pregnant sky woman fell from the hole in the sky world that was created when a great celestial tree in the sky world was withering and dying, such as we could hear in Dr. Tyrone's presentation. As she fell, she grasped at the edges of the hole where seeds and bits of sacred things became embedded under her fingernails. As naturalist and author John Weir said, when one tugs at a single thing in nature, he finds it attached to the rest of the world. The same is true of a woman's body. Indigenous cultures with strong symbol systems, such as this image of Ojijisu, mature flowers, our first mother, can use explanatory metaphors to fill in the public's cognitive holes about environmental health and build support for better policies at every level. Processes of transformation are always expansive in that enhanced and extended use of symbol systems, language, kinship, utilizes all our ways of knowing and learning, and involves all hierarchies of knowledge. To predict the health of our girls, we look at the health of their grandmothers. Our ancestral laws regarding kinship and clanship follow the matriline. From where we inherit our mitochondrial DNA, transmitted only through the female egg cells. We use this biological metaphor in translating knowledge from our creation narrative of Sky Woman to support the respect and empowerment of our young girls as they come to blood and voice in puberty and childbearing. 
Here's an image done in pen and ink by uh, a Mohawk artist in the 1980s when we first found that our community lay directly adjacent to what was then the largest PCB dump site in North America. And this pen and ink drawing reflects embodiment, the idea that social, economic, cultural, and political forces are expressed in bodies and are mediated by biological processes such as epigenesis. And so American developmental biologist uh, Bruce Lipton uh, promotes the idea that genes and DNA can be manipulated by a person's belief and so that thought, trauma, and toxics braid together and intertwine to cause the ill effects that we experience in the increased health disparities in indigenous communities globally. This is my community, uh, cut in half by the War of 1812 to disempower our nation. Uh, I come from this community that has the second largest land claim in all of Canada, where we were uh, uh, reduced in our uh, land base uh, by theft of Indian agents and Christian missionaries, specifically the Jesuits of France. And you don't need to see one more picture of sites <clears throat> like this because all you have to do is look out the window. Um, in my community, we have over 50 published papers from our environmental health research at Akwesasne that began with a breast milk study in 1981 when Mohawk mothers that I was delivering at home asked the question, is it safe to breastfeed? Our people live directly adjacent to uh, open open uh, swimming pools full of PCB oils that volatilize and move through the food chain. Um, we are historically fish eaters. We have always, I grew up in a subsistence economy. And so over the years, in the midst of a rapidly changing disease demographic, the, our community has expressed concerns regarding difficulty in reproduction and human health research shows PCB levels are related to reduced activity of the thyroid gland and precocious puberty, as well as subfertility. That as the uh, fecundity of the earth diminishes, the fertility of human beings follow. Language, culture, food preferences, psychoneuroimmunological development, as well as our human capacity for pair bonding and social engagement begin in the prenatal environment. Akwesasne Mohawk adolescents who had, breast, had been breastfed had significantly higher PCB levels than those who had not been breastfed, a difference that persisted into their young adulthood. Our, our attitude about this data throughout uh, the indigenous areas of Quebec and Ontario is that we will do as we have always done because the replacements for breastfeeding don't support uh, the bonding pair of the mother and the child. And so part of our uh, breast milk study uh, added to the uh, field research um, training for our clinical staff so that they would better support breastfeeding um, rates. And because of this training, we have some of the highest initiation and uh, duration rates of breastfeeding in New York State. In a Mohawk young adult well-being study, Shell and Gallo, 2010 at the University of Albany, our scientific partners who I recruited in 1983, found that Mohawk adolescents' average PCB levels were between the 90th and 95th percentiles of the US reference sample. And this data can be found at cdc.gov and ATSDR, the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. So that levels of the sum of 14 PCB congeners, of which there are more than 200 uh, molecular structures of PCBs, some affecting different organ systems and tissues of the body, the liver, the brain, found in 50% or more of the sample were more than twice the average for the US as described by the CDC. And this is evidence of the persistence of some of the PCB congeners. 
preliminary data from the Alkwazasini Women's Reproductive Health Study finds that only 35 of 124 participants have typical menstrual cycles. Subfertility in the remaining women is due to anovulatory cycles and impaired menstrual function. And so what do we do? How does a community respond to these realities? We all come from kinship structures, from families. We're grandmothers, mothers, grandfathers, fathers, uncles, aunties, sons, daughters. And so this, um, how do I go back? I, my, I'm trigger happy with my finger. Um, so at environmental, uh, health literacy definition at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, in which my community was one of three national demonstration projects funded in 1984 under a program for communications uh, for environmental justice, partnerships between healthcare providers, uh, research scientists, and community members. How do we break this news to our community? And so the definition of environmental health literacy is the degree to which individuals have the capacity to obtain, process, and understand health information, services, and skills needed to make informed health decisions and action. So one of the ways that we transformed our health systems and revised them to meet the challenges of the coming generations is to integrate centering pregnancy group prenatal care so that the specialized expert becomes the facilitator of women's knowledge and group care of about 10 to 12 women do about the same time uh, are able to uh, educate one another with the facilitator um, guiding them through uh, a handbook that meets the criteria for the biomedical needs of prenatal care. It only really takes about five minutes to do the physical assessment of a good prenatal visit, and the, and the other uh, 50 minutes is spent with the women sharing their stories and experiences of childbirth and childbearing. So the problem is not that prenatal clients of biomedical services fail to understand information about behavioral health issues and environmental health exposures, but rather that this information and communication fails to fit into already existing social and cultural systems of understanding reproductive health and health-related knowledge. So for example, transformation is a process that involves bringing together different aspects of something that didn't initially appear to be related so that the production of knowledge is integrative, transdisciplinary, and expansive. It involves making things whole and is reconstitutive. In changing perspectives, transformation increases knowledge of the self, thus impacting our belief systems and lifestyles. But transformative processes always are troublesome and counterintuitive, challenging at every level, physical, mental, emotional. But once made whole again is difficult to unlearn. And this is a drawing of the Mother of Nations pipe that's an ancient pipe that's been recovered in our communities for the service of the women. And we know uh, as practitioners that tobacco is one of the biggest health threats globally because the abuse of creation's uh, gifts and the lack of understanding of indigenous knowledge and the proper place of tobacco in our ceremonial practices. Our word for tobacco in Mohawk is uh, 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 translated to English. It hits and it opens. And it's used to communicate to those different levels of reality back into the sky world to connect. In a sense, it's our cord, our, our umbilical cord uncut. And so we know that corn and wheat in the American, standard American diet is one of the biggest uh, exposure routes of chlorpyrifos, one of the many pesticides, but a pesticide of concern because of its impact on neurological development in the uh, prenatal environment. And as our families eat the bread from the store that has been treated in grain mills, uh, silos across the country, uh, they are further exposed to chlorpyrifos. And so we use our own word, honaste, which in etymological regression, the, the sound ho 
means layers of protection. Ne from Ganeha, a seed or a spirit. The sound is t representing something sacred coming from a spirit. And the de, digini, the duality, the physical and spiritual male and female element. So it indicates layers of protection, a covering of the male and female. And so it, this indicates duality, the physical and the spiritual. And we ritualize our Six Nations youth under the husk over a four-year cycle of purification lodge, fasting, and ritual seclusion so that we can do preliminary ideological work to prepare them uh, for the challenges of reproduction. And so in the background of all of these environmental health challenges is the historical trauma response of indigenous people across the globe that are vectors of social and psychological distress transmitted by biological mechanisms and pathways persisting across the generations. So that we interweave tools of biomedicine and the intuitive gifts of our Mohawk language and culture. We circle up community members to support one another in dynamic atmospheres for learning and change across the life cycle. Contemporary indigenous performance practices address the complex violence of colonialism through ontological regeneration in the practice. Colonialism attempts to destroy and remake ontology as ways of imagining and enacting worlds to sustain regimes, regimes of power. This results in ontological shock, a type of trauma that violates people's ground of being. So indigenous performance practices in the Americas have long attempted to address this ontological shock through practices which regenerate our people in a variety of modes arising from particular historical and ecological circumstances. The National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences in which there's tons of information regarding um, uh, environmental health communications has come up with a new word, as scholars love to do, uh, the exposome, which is the environmental complement of the genome. One can imagine a future in which individuals' exposomes are contrasted between diseased and healthy populations for molecular epidemiology or over different life stages as part of personalized medicine. The goal would be to discover causes of ill health and to generate hypotheses regarding identification and elimination or reduction of harmful exposures. And this uh, approach to science is classic uh, uh, reductionist approaches that characterize uh, Western hegemony. And so in North America, we're experiencing a phenomenal surge of population recovery in our communities that's the foundation of our political and cultural rec uh, recovery in the face of persistent health disparities. I'm so glad to have been invited by Dr. Woodruff to participate on this panel. Uh, I was a member of the uh, program on reproductive health and the environment in 2010 and 11, the Reach the Decision Makers who trained a cohort of midwives, scientists, community leaders, and public health professionals to gain a better understanding of the underlying science linking environmental contaminants to reproductive harm, to develop an awareness of the regulatory and environmental health policy process, and build skills to help shape environmental health policy at the national level. Through this fellowship, our interdisciplinary team developed a scientific review and formulated policy recommendations on a common pesticide, chlorpyrifos, that has been linked to significant reproductive, neurological, and other health problems. In 2011, EPA sought public comments on chlorpyrifos for its preliminary human health risk assessment, and our team prepared a detailed comment letter supporting the position that US EPA needed to make a more comprehensive approach to their pesticide review process in order to ensure that registered pesticides such as CPF would not cause unreasonable adverse health effects. Uh, we didn't have a whole lot of good luck with that. Uh, but the evidence is there and at that time EPA had just opened its uh, office of Endocrine Disruption. 
And so here's um, the REACH program uh, images from the website. So in communities, how do we deal with these realities of reduction in fertility? Our ancestors un understood that the powers of the universe work in circles. Circling up pregnant mothers provides them the opportunity to participate in their prenatal care in an opening, welcoming environment enriched with the sharing of women's knowledge and experiences through the natural networks of women supporting women in a nurturing, centered atmosphere, echoing the ancient spirit of our clan families, of which we have three, wolf, turtle, and bear. I'm a wolf. We guide pregnant mothers through the centering pregnancy format that integrates health assessment, education, and support in a group care setting using the power of the circle as its basis. And so in reconstructing uh, those uh, knowledges and differences in power and wisdom that's inherent in our indigenous knowledge and ways of knowing and learning, we develop integrated environmental health, reproductive health messages for preconception care and pregnant women beyond alcohol and tobacco smoke exposures. This is a Cherokee birthing pipe found in the bowels of the Cultural Resources Center at the National Museum of the American Indian. This pipe was prayed with at the North American Birthing and Midwifery Conference 2009, uh, attend, uh, 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 supported by the Indian Health Service and the First Nations and Inuit Health Branch of Canada an international meeting held under a memorandum of understanding to share research, knowledge, and best practices between the US and Canada. And so uh, last spring, there was a foundational uh, meeting in Ottawa, the University of Ottawa, um, on prenatal environmental health uh, education. And so uh, again, another, here's the, the um, the, uh, uh, the Mother of Nations pipe brought back into practice, um, and it, it is used in uh, ceremonial practice and not in everyday uh, life. And I love how the sacred tobacco offering th th is made at the bowl of the woman's uh, viscera. And so the environmental reproductive health of adolescents and young adults is a major determinant of their future well-being. And so by supporting healthcare professionals in practicing the art and science of nurturing prenatal mothers, as well as the rites of passage that we are regenerating in my community and are evaluating and developing curriculum for our other Six Nations community, haven't you in a prenatal setting wished and asked the mother, what has your family taught you about birth? And that that knowledge begins at the time uh, when they enter puberty. Uh, and we know that through epigenetic processes, puberty has been disrupted. And in my community, uh, along with 30 years of environmental uh, reproductive health research, uh, we've tracked the nutritional intakes of a cohort of our youth who were involved in some of these health studies and see the lowered testosterone levels in our adolescent boys that um, was recently uh, represented in the atrazine presentation by Dr. Tyrone. Um, and so to prepare our youth, there has to be a broader communications uh, that's grounded in cultural concepts because it's overwhelming. As you sit here in an environmental health presentations, uh, the risk is that you become, uh, it, it, it can't be integrated in a way where you can make a difference. And so this knowledge, the difference, the power of these messages have to be translated to communities and it requires that and, and, uh, the integration of environmental health and reproductive health, and I encourage uh, all of our uh, knowledge to be used. And so I hope that in this presentation you are able to better understand that culture is the context through which these messages can be interpreted. Uh, I think of our uh, relatives from Mexico uh, and the dangers that they're uh, faced with in terms of the data 
presented before my presentation. Uh, I am an environmental justice uh, advocate. I worked on the Indigenous Peoples Working Group at the Environmental Protection Agency as a direct result of participating in the REACH team. And over the years have um, participated in workshops at the International Joint Commission um, Scientific Advisory Board at um, the International Joint Commission. And so we have to keep plugging away over time at every entry point. But in the clinical setting, um, there's a lot of information at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences website, as well as the program on reproductive health and the environment. Uh, and I guess Dr. Woodruff will be speaking next to expand on, on that work. Uh, <laughs> These are some of the sounds of these ritual, the ritualization of our youth to prepare them and to give them tools to strengthen their self-esteem after uh, suffering the thoughts of colonization, the trauma, and now the exposures to a toxic environment. And as a midwife, uh, receiving new life into our hands as OBs and as Yuwilogwas, uh, that we indeed are pulling these babies out of the waters, out of the earth, and the dark, wet places of complexity and chaos. Neto, thank you. Kaji, thank you very much. I think we heard clearly from both Dr. Hayes and Kaji how much we're providing the care and the interest for underserved populations because of where they're being exposed, and certainly the, under, the, um, the very vulnerable fetus that we provide care for. And this is Dr. Tracy Woodruff. Good morning. You're probably wondering why atrazine and chlorpyrifos are still being used in the United States. and. Uh, I think it's really, uh, and plus also, why some of the science doesn't really get to the places it needs to go or why people don't do things. And the challenge is, it was great that uh, Kochi talked about uh, going to EPA and uh, talking with them because they're the main regulatory agency in the United States who regulates uh, in industrial chemicals and pesticides and how it was a good but challenging experience. So I think it's really illustrative, and actually it's great timing to talk about um, this person, Frances Kelsey. You may not know who she is. She just passed away this year um, at the age of 101. But she worked at the Food, Food and Drug uh, Administration. You probably know this, though, which is thalidomide. So the reason that thalidomide was not widely used in the United States was because of France, Dr. Frances Kelsey, who worked at a regulatory agency in the United States before it was actually a real regulatory agency. So back when she worked at FDA, the manufacturers of thalidomide came to her and they said, we want you to prescribe this to pregnant women. It's really awesome as an anti-nausea medication. But she looked at the data and she said, you know, there's not very much data on this and they want me to prescribe this to give, to allow pregnant women across the United States to have this drug. And she said no, and she took them papers and put them in the desk drawer. It's actually very interesting when you read her obituary. She was uh, kind of surprised at how mad the manufacturers were at her that she would not approve this drug for use in the United States. Well, it did get approved in Europe, and these are the tragic consequences, as you can see, these birth defects that happened to these children. But the other thing that happened was that because of this tragedy, the United States, which had in the Senate been considering for years, or was a senator who did want to have FDA look at safety and efficacy of drugs before they went onto the marketplace, and that bill had been moribund. It had been sitting around, not going anywhere, but because this happened, they picked that bill up and they passed it, and it became the modern food and drug uh, safety laws in the United States, and Francis Kelsey was honored. Um, uh, by President Kennedy with a, a presidential medal for her work on this topic. And now, you're probably all familiar with this, but drugs go through a lot of testing. They go through preclinical trials, in vitro and in vivo testing. They go through randomized uh, trials where they're given in different types of uh, human trials. So that there's a lot of testing before uh, physicians can actually 
use this drug or prescribe a drug for their patient. Now, here's another interesting thing about thalidomide, so the chemical structures on the top. You might know the other one, diethylstilbestrol, which also another drug that was widely prescribed to pregnant women with tragic consequences later for their children, uh, also before uh, the Food and Drug Act. They're what we would call in the research field small molecules, and they look very similar to something like polybrominated diphenyl ethers, which you might find in lots of different polyurethane foam. It's a flame retardant, widely used and distributed around the globe. Triclosan, which is another small molecule. It's uh, antimicrobial. It's actually registered as a pesticide because it's an antimicrobial, but uh, we were looking in one of the bathrooms. You might find it in the soap here at the bathroom at the conference. Um, a thyroid hormone disruptor. And then this is BPA, which is probably the most famous chemical of this lot, because you probably know it, it's a plasticizer used in the lining of cans and plastics, also distributed worldwide in millions of pounds. But you can see these chemicals, they're like cousins, right? The drugs and the manufactured drugs and the manufactured chemicals are all small molecules that are manufactured for some purpose. But we know that pharmaceuticals have to be uh, tested for safety and efficacy before their use uh, on the marketplace, but that is not true for manufactured chemicals. And I think that's one of the things that we find when you're in the environmental health field, it's just pretty well known that chemicals can act like atrazine or chlorpyrifos. They can interfere with hormonal systems. We know they can mimic different types of uh, hormones in the body. And the thing that's very challenging is that most people who work outside the environmental health field, particularly when we are work and engaging with physicians is they just really, and the population don't know that chemicals that are manufactured for not a pharmaceutical use do not have uh, requirements to be tested before they go out into the environment and into your home and then potential for have adverse health consequences. So that is one of the just basic challenges. Now it is true that in Europe they do have a law that um, requires some testing to understand to, for chemicals for them to remain on the marketplace. Though I would say remain on the marketplace because they're going through a big shift in terms of chemicals are already being out on the market and we're already being exposed to them. Um, and then they're doing sort of a backstop in terms of their testing. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, the relationship between pr professional societies and, um, and public policy laws, particularly in the United States. So, well, I'm going to focus a lot because I do a lot of work in the United States, and but this is our first foray into working with uh, folks around the globe on the t uh, issue of environmental chemicals. It has been noted both in the U.S. as well as by the OECD that hazardous chemicals and wastes are a red light issue. What does a red light issue mean? It means this is an issue that is of concern globally because it's not well, well managed and we are anticipating that global use of pesticides and industrial chemicals will continue to grow. And they will grow. Right now, they are largely manufactured in the developed world, but they are anticipated to shift from manufacturing in the developed world to primarily being um, manufactured and used in the developing world. So this represents a global challenge for everybody. So you heard uh, about atrazine and chlorpyrifos. I talked a little bit about PBDEs, which is a uh, thyroid hormone disruptor. Triclosan is also a thyroid hormone disruptor. BPA, which is uh, uh, an estrogenic uh, substance, which has been shown to adversely impact development. But those are just a fraction of the chemicals that we know something about. I think it's uh, one thing that's important to realize is that we only have information on a very small subset of the chemicals that are used in, in high amounts in, for example, the United States. So there's about 200 chemicals that have been tested for safety, uh, or not even tested, but thoroughly tested, uh, compared to almost uh, 6,500 chemicals that are used in what's considered high amounts, so greater than 25,000 pounds. Some of them, like atrazine, in millions or billions of pounds. And so this is, I'm going to call this in terms of the science, the indirect evidence about why, why there's just increasing concern and why it's so important that we are engaging with the clinical community at this time. And that is because we're seeing a growth. This is just in the United States, but it's mimicked worldwide in the use of industrial, the manufacturing importation of industrial chemicals um, 
into the United States, which has grown over 15-fold since the 1940s. So I talked about uh, the plasticizers, but there's also uh, another chemical which I'll speak a little bit more about, which is uh, the Teflon chemicals, PFOA. And uh, you saw the data on the atrazine and how we're finding that in many different people in many different places around the United States. And it's not unusual that we're seeing, if we're manufacturing a lot of industrial chemicals and they're being in used in many different products and in many different places, that we also measure them in women, in children, and families all over the globe. And this is an example of the, a study that we did at UCSF looking at data that's collected nationally by the uh, federal government measuring chemicals in the population. And this was a focus just on pregnant women, because as you heard, pregnancy is a time of very important development, a very vulnerable period, and it represents a period where the fetus can be exposed even before entry into the world. And we found that there were 43 different chemicals. Now, these are ones that were found uh, in all the pregnant women that were measured in the United States. But on top of that, different groups of women may be exposed to different types of chemicals. So for example, farm workers or people who are working in, um, who are living in poor communities are gonna ha can have higher exposures to many of these different types of industrial chemicals beyond this baseline of 43. So, I think the other thing that people don't realize is when you think about chemicals, and it's uh, and sometimes when you hear about this discussed in the news, people are like, oh, it's just a little bit. Um, sometimes people say, well, it's like a tablespoon in a swimming pool. Yes, but that's just maybe one, but there are more than one. There are multiple, and it's not just a couple pounds per person, but if we look at data from EPA, they published 9.5, I just like, trillion pounds, and that's 30,000 pounds of chemicals per person. So we're talking about very vast amounts of uh, industrial use, and, and again, largely, we have little information both about where they're being used, how people are being exposed, and uh, the impacts that they may have on health. So this is the other compelling um, statistic, and you have, if you have been attending uh, uh, all the different discussions about environmental chemicals during the last three days, you've probably seen some version of this, which is that the rate of change of chronic diseases is increasing. This is for the United States, but it's also going up in other countries, um, and there's been uh, data that's been published by WHO and UNEP around uh, in increasing levels of chronic diseases both in Europe and other countries. This is uh, illustrative, and I like this study because it puts all the conditions in one uh, one graph, which is the increase in obesity, asthma, actually it's not something we talk about, but asthma, which is thought to have an in utero component, and behavioral problems, meaning ADHD and autism. And they've all been increasing in children in the United States over the last 20 to 30 years. So the links between these are making people concerned. We have increasing amounts of chemicals going up in terms of manufacturing, increasing levels of chronic disease, what is the link between the two? Now, I'm not going to, no one here is going to say that chemical exposures cause all the diseases that I just talked about, but they're certainly a risk factor for many of them, and they're very understudied and undervalued and compared to some of the other risk factors we look at uh, it's for some of these diseases. So in the United States, about one in six children are diagnosed with a developmental disability. And I think it's very important to remember that a lot of times when we talk about chronic conditions, we think of this as a developed world problem, but now what we're seeing is a, uh, from reports is that this is also a problem in the developing world. This is a report by the Council on Foreign Relations, not your typical uh, public health agency, and they were looking at uh, the increases in what they call non-communicable diseases, that's code word for chronic conditions, so heart disease, cancer, obesity, and diabetes, and they said that it was going up, and it was going up faster than communicable diseases were going down. And the other thing that they noted in this report was that it was a, a particularly affecting younger ages. So their concern was more a lot because this is representing all, not just a crisis because people have these health conditions, but also it puts a strain on their um, medical facilities who in developing worlds are already constrained by other types of uh, challenges. 
So when you're to proceed in one of the things that we have, I uh, sit in a medical university at UCSF in a department of OBGYNs. I work with a lot of doctors and, and we get a lot of questions from patients about how do I, people want to know about this. What, what is, when you talk to me about environmental chemicals, what do we know about what they can do? And um, one of the things that we have been very engaged with is how do we outreach to clinicians? Why are we very interested in working with doctors? Well, you, doctors are important because they are the interface with patients that we are particularly, the population we care, we care about everyone, but we really care about pregnant women for all the reasons that you heard during this talk. And they're that primary contact uh, for not only, uh, for women who are, sick, but women who are healthy. The other reason is the doctors speak with a lot of authority and they have a lot of respect. So when they speak or you speak on behalf of your patients in any venue, people will listen to you, particularly in all the areas that we think are important in order to make change. And, we, and, and one of those areas is focusing on these larger societal changes that can only happen if we engage with governmental authorities. So what is it that doctors know about this? Well, when we started working with OBs, and um, hopefully Dr. Connery will be uh, in agreement with what I said, which is that uh, they really did not have a lot of information about what were environmental chemical exposures. I think we started working together five years ago, six years ago. Uh, I have to say that except for Dr. Judice, who did start, who started the program on reproductive health and the environment at UCSF, the, doctors were largely unfamiliar with this topic about environmental chemicals. They thought they were important, but they weren't really sure what to do about it. And most of them said, you know, the source of information I trust the most is my uh, professional society. And in, in the United States, that would be the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. So our task was to think about how can we engage with physicians in a way that makes this meaningful to them in terms of what they're doing both on the ground with their patients, but also through their professional societies. So one of the things that um, doctors are very responsive to, so doctors said ACOG is the professional society that gives us our guidance on how we, uh, on, on the guidelines that we interface with our patients. And so we said, we well, then we should talk with ACOG because if this is a condition or a concern, environmental chemical exposures, pregnant women are exposed. We know from the evidence that there are is links to adverse reproductive health impacts. It makes sense that the professional society of ACOG should be engaged on this topic, and they agreed. And this is the committee opinion that was published between ACOG and the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, putting their stamp on this issue, saying this issue of environmental chemicals is important to doctors and that we need to do something about it, including educating ourselves about the um, about how this may impact our patients, but more importantly, because many of these exposures, as you've heard, like with atrazine or chlorpyrifos, the engagement can only happen when we work with government agencies to make sure that they are doing what they're supposed to be doing to prevent to either prevent them or take things off the market when they're identified health effects. Now, we had, we're just in the beginning, so you can see we haven't been quite as successful as we should be yet, but um, I think with these new partnerships that we are engaged in, that's the steps that we need to take in order to do something more transformative around industrial chemicals. So one of the things that was very challenging when speaking with doctors, and uh, Dr. Hayes uh, alluded, uh, talked a little bit about this, is that uh, you're, you have the benefit of the food and uh, the drug testing laws that have come because of the thalidomide tragedy. And so that means and lots of animal studies, randomized trials on humans. Uh, this joke says, your research is very promising. It's just a shame you're afraid of mice, meaning there goes the patient out because they didn't test it in mice. Well, industrial chemicals, we have, um, how do we think about looking at the science of that? We've been thinking very hard because we want to look at the science in the way that is familiar to the physicians and the uh, clinical community so that they can um, be uh, comfortable with that information. And one of the, so that's one thing. The second thing is, is that we have to think about um, also the role of the types of information that we have when we're looking at industrial chemicals. It would be unethical to do randomized trials with industrial chemicals on patients. They're not, industrial chemicals are not made for a, uh, to treat some type of health condition or for a beneficiary purpose in that sense. So we have to rely on animal studies and observational human studies. So that's the evidence that we have, but we also need to think about um, 
how do we apply the tools that have developed in evidence-based medicine, how can we apply that to environmental health so that we can improve our ability to um, evaluate the information in environmental health because then that strengthens the credibility when we go to talk with regulatory agencies and it also makes the uh, science more familiar and uh, comfortable to the clinical community. So we have been engaged in the last four years on um, taking the principles of evidence-based medicine that have been developed over 20 years through uh, the Co Cochrane collaboration and GRADE and applying those principles which are very similar to environmental health sciences, particularly the animal and the human observational literature. Because the thing is, is that the things that are important about when you test a drug in terms of randomized controlled trials, do you have a blinded trial, did you randomize, did you blind for the outcome as well as assessment, those features which make a good experiment that you will trust the evidence are the same methodological features that we can use to think about for animal data as well as human observational data. Meaning that if the animal data and the human observational data have those same quality attributes in the evaluation of the science, then that means that we have, we can evaluate that science and then use it to create a bottom line summary that physicians can then use to act on or regulators. So uh, this is a, a group of who have been involved in the uh, development of the navigation guide, which is an evidence-based method for evaluating environmental chemicals. They come from both clinical sciences as well as environmental health sciences, regulatory agencies as well, uh, both nationally and internationally. And so here is the, an example. I talked, I alluded to this chemical. It's perfluorooctanoic acid. It's PFOA. It's a a chemical that's used to repel things, mostly stains. It's used in um, uh, stain-resistant carpets. It's used in, um, uh, it's like a Teflon chemical that's used in pans. It's used to repel water, like in uh, Gore-Tex parkas. It's found everywhere. And it's also a persistent chemical, so it gets out and about in the environment. Um, it's been, it's such a high-use chemical that it's been measured in fish, in birds, in polar bears. These are animals that aren't cooking, so they're getting exposed because it's uh, traveling the world globally. It's also illustrative of why we need to think about these chemicals on a global scale, because they, even if they're manufactured in the United States, they get everywhere in the world. And they get into us, and this is one of the chemicals that we, that has been measured in many different places, including uh, across the United States and 99% uh, of pregnant women. So just in a summary, what we're seeing is that uh, if you look at this, the dark line is no effect of PFOA. We're very interested in whether it affects birth weight. We looked in animals and humans. To the left means it affects birth weight. And you can see once we use these methods that really what we see is a lineup between the animal and the human evidence that, uh, that PFOA is uh, related to decrements in birth weight across both animal and human and our meta-analyses showed that PFOA is associated with lower birth weight. I will say that this is, seems pretty obvious once you look at the data like this, but up until now, there had been at least eight narrative reviews that had conflicting results about what they thought about PFOA and birth weight. It wasn't until we used these methods that we were able to provide a more consistent, transparent evaluation of the science. And so we have a very simple conclusion that it's known to be toxic to humans and reproduction based on effects on birth weight. That's a very easy thing that you can understand, a clinician can understand if they're talking to their patient, or a policymaker can understand without a lot of wiggle room. So I want to uh, end with this, which is a, um, a doctor talking to a patient. He says, I'm afraid there's not much I can do for you now. You should have come in sooner before you got sick. So what we are doing here is we're trying to prevent people from coming in when they're sick. And that means that if we stop the exposure before they get, people get exposed, if we know it's uh, going to adversely impact health, then we can stop the disease from happening. It's very simple. Now, PFOA is a great chemical to talk about because um, they saw that this was, that there were PFOAs being measured in many people and it was getting out. not as they had anticipated from the manufacturer and actually was voluntarily phased out in the United States. And you can see it would happen around the 1990s that P those are PFOA levels. They're going up and then they start to go down because once you take a chemical off the marketplace, we can see reductions in the exposures to that chemical. So that means that we can have an intervention 
and we can reduce exposures. Because one of the things that's very challenging about talking about this is it seems very overwhelming, but I want people to know that when we take an action, things will change and subsequent health effect improvements will happen. So that's why it's so important that we are engaged with the International Society of FIGO because they represent uh, physician groups from around the globe. And this, uh, because just like with PFO or atrazine or any of these chlorpyrifos, they travel worldwide. And so it's important to be engaged not only with the individual countries, but also with other countries who are working on similar issues. And Jeannie talked about the recommendations. I would just say we've had a summit here. It's been really uh, great. And I want to thank everyone at the Program on Reproductive Health and the Environment who has made uh, this all possible and our work possible. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll hear closing remarks from Dr. Jennifer Blake. You can tell that we're hearing um, a theme here, that we've got exposures for vulnerable populations, and then Tracy very clearly is talking about what our role is to, in advocacy. Well, I was asked to speak uh, on a vision for the future, and I think it's very clear from what we've heard today that if we don't change anything, if we don't change what we're doing, then the future is going to look exactly like the past. Uh, but what I hope now is that we understand that there are things that we can do. And is there anyone here today who thinks that actually the status quo is good enough? You can, lay, you can raise your hand if you think that, no. Okay, so uh, we don't want what we've got right now. I, I think that, uh, that probably what I should have chosen as my symbol is the dandelion, because the dandelion is something that I grew up believing was a weed, and, uh, and certainly uh, we spent lots of time picking dandelions as children, and I know that, that uh, dandelions, we've sprayed for dandelions. Ever. Toronto decided to stop spraying herbicides anywhere in the city anyone, commercial or private, and all of a sudden dandelions sprouted everywhere, and um, now because they're not chemically treated, you can actually eat them. So um, they've turned from a weed to, a, to kind of a, a nice spring salad green. Likewise, the family car, does anyone remember this car? <laughs> Everyone thought it was normal that a car could blow up on the way to the grocery store. Um, it, it took someone to say, it's not normal before car safety changed. And I think that's the problem that we've seen. We have to name the problem because this problem is ubiquitous and invisible. Uh, we have to practice being able to rip those names off our tongue. Um, people who built this particular house or bought this house probably thought the view was awesome. They just didn't notice that their backyard was crumbling year by year by year. And one day, they're going to wake up and their back wall is going to be gone. Um, and that's kind of the situation we're in. People think that, um, that it doesn't matter. It doesn't seem to hurt most people. It must be because they've overdone it. Um, but in, the fact is that this is complex. There's multiple factors. There's mitigating and aggravating conditions. And it's complex. It's not a simple thing like baking a cookie. It's not complicated. Whoa, this is going too fast. Um, it's not complicated like putting a man on the moon. It's complex. And the best analogy for complex is raising a child. Um, what you do for one child isn't going to work for the next because we're, we're biologic systems and we're complex. And that's what our environment is like. We can use science as a barrier. We can say we need more evidence. We can say we need an RCT. We can say it's not rock solid. But we actually have plenty of science to act right now. We will never have an RCT, and we don't get one. Um, we also need to understand that this is not a burden that is borne equally. And so we, as privileged healthcare providers and professionals in our societies, do not have the same burden of illness that people who are less fortunate have. I learned on Sunday that in the Central Valley of, of California, uh, where the food and agriculture comes from, 48% of women give birth preterm. That's an astonishing number. So we have to be advocates for women who are less fortunate. Katya, can you pronounce the name of this river, this, this area? This, this is, a, this is, a, this is oh, near Sarnia. This is Amgenang First Thank Nation in, near Sarnia, Ontario. And you can see here that the air is polluted, 
that, that those toxins are falling in the water, so the water will be polluted. And if you're fishing and eating the fish that come out of that water, you're getting an amplified risk. We have to think of those who are in very vulnerable circumstances. And I think we have to adhere to the precautionary principle. It's been said many times. Until we have conclusive evidence, we have to do the safe thing. As it's been said, no one is going to do a randomized controlled trial on parachutes or on ligating bleeding vessels. But what we do know, and it's really important, is that past pred behavior predicts future behavior. And where it comes to this, our past behavior is good. We have cut down on smoking in public places. My mother grew up in London when there were pea soup fogs that the police had to walk in front of the bus because the fog was so thick that the driver couldn't see where to drive the bus. And does anyone know, know what that image is in the bottom left-hand corner? Oh, bottom right. Bottom left? That's the Broad Street pump. Broad Street pumps. Uh, James Snow just said this, this uh, caller has to stop. And he, he got his little map, and he went down at night, and he took the handle off the pump. And that was the end of the problem. And we did that with lead and gasoline. We just took the handle off the pump. Mm -hmm. So it's our turn for action. Let's not blame women for eating the food and breathing the air. It is the food and the air that we've got, and we have an opportunity to make a difference. We have influence as individuals in the choices that we make in our homes. We have influence in, within our professions to, uh, to, take, to take strong positions and stick to them. And we have in, influence in our communities to make a difference. And we have the ability to fix this problem. There is strength in numbers, and you've, we are building on work that has been done uh, leading up to this, and now we have our own position. And you can understand, having heard these presentations today, why we need to be advocating for policies, why we need a healthy food system, why we need to incorporate environmental health into our everyday reproductive health, and why we need to be advocates for social justice. And that is my vision for this future. Thank you. health of your body and your environment are closely tied together. So when we expose our world to toxic chemicals like pesticides, air pollutants, lead and plastics, we're trashing ourselves. And it's triggering problems for families everywhere. Problems like childhood cancer, testicular cancer, miscarriage, ADHD, and lower IQ. It's why doctors from 125 countries want policies to prevent exposure to toxic chemicals. You can help. After all, a healthier world means a healthier you.